Now let us stand together. Let us open up our Bibles, whether it's a pew Bible or your own. Open up God's Word because it's living and He uses it. So we need to read it ourselves together and individually. John chapter 21, verses 20 through 25. If you notice, this is the end of the Gospel of John. Did you ever feel like you would get to this day? (laughs) We have arrived. Um, Thankful for this series. I pray that it has been beneficial and fruitful for you and your life. Uh, And then we'll have one sermon that's kind of a a separate sermon next week, and then we're going to get into Habakkuk uh, the week after. So uh, before we um, get into Habakkuk uh, next week will be an important one. Uh, But let us read God's Word this morning. John chapter 21, verses 20 through 25. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and, he, and, and, said, and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So as we get into this text here and connect it uh, to last week, the beginning here, it sounds like Jesus' command was not only in the deep spiritual sense to continue in a living faith, to follow in the deepest spiritual sense of that new heart, abiding in the newness of life, And not only as well in the practical sense, where from here on out, Peter was to follow more intentionally. We already know that he already was following. But now he's getting more of that intentional call to follow with a solid motivation from his love for Jesus. And that being first, that being his first foundation, his first motivation to move from. It's not only those two, but Jesus' command was also quite literal. So they're sitting having a meal. Picture this. They're sitting having a meal, and then Jesus confronts Peter, as we looked at last week, commanding him to feed his lambs, tend his sheep, feed his sheep. Then Jesus commands Peter to follow him. That's what we heard right at the end, right? Right? And then quite literally, they got up. And Peter started following Jesus wherever Jesus was going. Because what does our passage say right away? Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. So it's interesting and kind of funny. If you, I was thinking about it. I just can imagine Peter like getting up and following Jesus and then kind of turning what is he doing? You know, you literally told us to follow you. Like, you literally meant us to actually follow, to follow you physically, to go from that place and continue on. It's interesting, yet it shows that when someone truly follows Jesus, they get going. Right away, they get going. Answering the call to follow Jesus has an immediate response. Those struggle will start quite immediately as well. And life will be difficult with the personal war that we all have against the sinful flesh that needs to be progressively cut away in sanctification. There is still an action and an active push to follow right away 
the response, follow our master, our shepherd. And it begins right away to strive forward. It begins right away to start walking on the paths of righteousness for Jesus' namesake. When God brings someone to life at salvation, they immediately are standing up and they begin to walk. It is either following or it's a rejection. Right? There's always a, a response to the word of Christ. There's always a response to those who are before him, which is all of creation. And by God's grace alone, those that can answer his call will, and they will follow. And those who are left in the blindness of their sin reject him. It is either obedience or disobedience. So even though Peter still has some things to work on that need the refining work of God within him that will happen, Peter is following Jesus. And we know, again, very imperfectly, as we know who Peter is. So we see these weaknesses still at the beginning here with Peter. And that is the first area of focus, if you follow along in your bulletin, which is Peter versus John. And then after that, we'll look at just John with some points that come out of what is said about him that I think are very important. And then we'll finish with focusing on Jesus and ultimately the triune God. So Peter is still having a hard time comparing himself to others or to put it another way, worrying about others. He may not be thinking about being a step above John, uh, here in a kind of being the best disciple compar- in comparison to others, like we heard last week, but there is still some comparison with what he will do compared to what John will do. And going forward, looking ahead, what will Peter do? What will John do? This puts into context a little bit more the incident where John and Peter were running to the empty tomb. In that very event, we don't get details of why he ran. But as we hear kind of all the other details as it progresses, we can kind of put things together. And John beats Peter there. So Peter may have these and other instances on his mind. John is following Jesus too. So what will his ministry work look like? What will God call him to do? What is his purpose? Peter asks, Lord, what about this man? Whatever the purpose is for John, Jesus responds and says what? What is it to you? What is it to you if it's my will to do this or that? Is, it, is, is Jesus telling Peter in this, to just be careless, to not really give a care about what anyone else will do for Jesus? Is that really what's meant? Oh, who cares about anybody else? What is it to you? Just focus on you. Should Peter just be focused just on himself in a selfish, selfish way where it's all about what he's doing? Is that really what Jesus is kind of bringing out? should easily say, of course not, right? That's not what Jesus means. What does Jesus mean? Every believer has a purpose that rests in the sovereign will of God. So we are not to be overly concerned with what the will of God is for this person or that person in an impure way. And we can see this with Peter, how he's really kind of compared himself to others in, in very uh, wrong ways. We are, we are to stay focused on following Christ. This is because we would compare ourselves with others like their purposes may, bo- may be more important than ours. We can easily do that. Have you do, done that? Or we can think that maybe theirs is going to be more fruitful. Or maybe it's more because God loves them more. 
can easily go there, right? need to be very careful of these situations. This is where the question of Jesus in the last section may seem to get turned around in Peter's head where he starts to think, so so so-and-so will do this. Is that because Jesus loves them more than me? Instead of Jesus saying to Peter, do you love me more than these, those other disciples, as he said, as we heard last week, Peter may be saying to himself, does Jesus love these other disciples, especially John, more than me? Could that easily be going through his head, given who he is and what we learn about him? Yeah. Jesus says, if it's my will that he remain, what is it to you? And Peter's like, does he love him more than me? Because he just declared how I'm going to die. What will John be doing compared to what I will be doing? Will it be better? Will he do more? Will he be known more than me? Be more popular? But is that where Peter should be going? Is that where any of us who are in Christ should go? And this is where application gets really heavy because we need to then take an honest look at ourselves, right? And stop looking out there, which is so easy to do, to compare ourselves. We should not be going and saying, well, what if they're going to do better things? What if they're going to be known more? Is that because Jesus loves them more than me? And when that happens, we can easily start to be brought down and start to get inside of us and start to listen to that enemy that just wants to get a little in here and a little in there and create a snowball effect. This can easily happen to ourselves when we understand, again, as I explained last week, our sinful nature, that by nature we're turned inside, we're turned to look at ourselves, to worship ourselves. So we need to be very careful in comparing ourselves to one another and even saying, well, but I should be there too. I should have this. Why does he get that? Why is she going that much further? Or why is she doing this? Or whatever it may be. I'm coaching soccer right now, and I'm hearing a lot of that. It's not even the beginning of the season. And I'm hearing, why am I not here? Why am I not there? We can easily compare ourselves to other people. We can easily turn that inward with an anxiousness and a doubt that is not healthy at all. We need to learn from these situations and say God is sovereign over every single situation. And if you're in Christ, he's sovereign over your whole life. And his purpose will be accomplished. So we need to keep that in mind. Because if we grow in any type of ministry, which every Christian should, should be involved in some type of ministry, in some fashion, We can easily get into ministries and we can easily take a business competition mindset and bring it in, especially if you're wanting to grow a ministry and grow it in this technological age. And look at this person. Oh, they've got this thriving social media or this thriving internet ministry that they've got all of these followers. Why? I should be there. Why doesn't that happen for me? Or other ministries, anything else, we can bring in a business competition mentality to be cut above the other and to fight, to push, to be the first and compare ourselves to the other. We can also feel like we are getting the short end of the stick when we see what other people are doing. Well, they're doing all of this stuff. And me as a pastor and as a preacher... I can easily, and this is the problem with conferences, 
I can easily be like, oh, those are the conference preachers. And they're at these big conferences that are like 2,000 people, 4,000 people, 6,000 people. Why am I not there? Why don't I have that ministry? Is it, there something wrong? Does Jesus not love me more than those disciples? Right? Why are they doing that when I could say, well, I'm stuck in this little church, which is nothing wrong with that at all. I love it. And that is where it's really important. That is where it's crucial that pastors need to have a focus here to what? To feed the lambs, to shepherd the sheep, and to feed the sheep. But Peter has an easy mentality to compare himself to others. Well, what will John be doing? And Jesus says, what is that to you? In the big picture, what is that to you? We need to remember our position in Christ. And these things will help us ground ourselves, help us guard against these mentalities that we can give into. We need to remember that we are 100% justified before God, 100% righteous before God. The moment we come to have that new life and look upon Christ by faith, that will never, ever change. No matter what you do, what God calls you to do, compared to what God calls somebody else to do. And all throughout the rest of those situations, you are 100%, if you are truly in Christ, 100% justified. That does, not dis that does not decrease at all. That is different from your sanctification. Your sanctification is where you, God works in you to work through you in a progressive way so that you grow yourself inside to be more holy, to be more righteous in practical terms. And then that is worked out in what you do in life and where God calls you and where God grows you to step further out into some area of life, giving you more boldness to step out. I went to Bethlehem this past Tuesday, sat in city council meeting and spoke against abortion. Never done that before. And boy, was that nerve wracking. That was weird. But those are instances where God will, as you follow Christ and as he works in you, he will cause you to step out further and further and further, all according to the sovereign will of God. So do not compare yourself to other people in other situations. Well, why is he going further? Is it because I'm doing something? Maybe you got to look inward, right? There's lessons to be learned, but ultimately it's because God is sovereign. His will is different for different people in practical terms. So our sanctification causes us to grow in those practical ways. And we need to then actually believe then that God is sovereign, totally sovereign, actually totally sovereign over every detail of your life. He's ordered all of your steps. But that does not make you a robot. He works within you to cause you to grow and to, to honor him in your new nature. And that is your own desire that God has implanted in you. And it's genuine and it's real. Yet God is sovereign over all of that. And you need to believe that. Because that is utterly crucial in times like this where Peter can be like, well, but what about him? And then the effects of what that can do. When God is sovereign over John's life, God is sovereign over Peter's life. Each of them will have a different calling in practical ways. Each of them will be used for his purpose, and that's where it steps up in practicality. God's sovereign in all of your life, over all of your life, and you are 100% justified in him, yet sanctively, progressively growing in your call and your purpose, and his purpose will be accomplished for your life. 100%. It'll be flawless from his perspective. Everything that he intends for you to do, it will be done. Guaranteed. He's sovereign over that purpose. You see that in uh, Jeremiah. You see that in Paul's life. You see that in Peter's life. And every believer, God is sovereign in his purpose over your life. So anything that happens, 
Anything that he does through you, regardless of what other people are doing, it will happen. And guess what? His purpose is good. Why? Because his purpose comes from who he is. By nature, he's a good God. He's a righteous God. He's infinitely wise. So when you're starting to question where you're going and you're maybe comparing yourself to others in various ways, you come back to say, okay, is God good? Yes. Is God sovereign completely, totally? Yes. Is God infinitely wise in everything that he does? Everything is perfect? Yes. Okay. So everything that he's going to do in my life and call me to do is good, perfect, and wise. And that's what it's supposed to be. Not only when you were born, but before the foundation of the world. Right? We need to learn from people like Jeremiah. What did he say about Jeremiah? The very beginning. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I separated you for holy purposes. That's what that means. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. That's his purpose. That's his calling. And that will be fulfilled. Because God is sovereign and he brings the, new, uh, he brings the dead sinner to life and causes them to have that new heart that wants that will. The will of God for their life. But we can easily go, but I deserve that. But I expect to be here. I expect this in return. Again, I'm seeing this play out where freshmen, especially them, but everybody, thinks that they deserve a spot on varsity immediately, right away. And they expect it to happen. So when we come to God with that mentality, what are we acting like? I'm entitled. I deserve this because I think I deserve it. And I think I expect that to happen. But what do we all deserve in reality? At the very base of everything, at the very base of history and life itself, what do you and I deserve? We deserve damnation. We deserve hell. We deserve what we deserve, right? Punishment for what we've done. So it's only by God's grace that you're even in Christ to begin with, that you're even a new creature, a creation, a new creature, saved in Christ Jesus by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, where the Spirit's brought you to life. That's by grace alone. That concept, that reality, that truth should then be applied to what you do in life and how your purpose, God's purpose for you will be drawn out. And it will be very different from other people. So we need to be grounded in these truths so that then we can practically analyze life and understand it rightly. Any, you, any part of you living out God's purpose is incredible. If you really think about it. Because again, what do you deserve? So he gives mercy. What we do not deserve. Grace. And that propels us forward into a life for God's will to glorify God. And to be an honorable vessel used for his purposes. So Jesus says, what is it to you? Don't be caught up in John's life and where John is going and my purpose for him. Focus on where I'm leading you, where you're following me. Go there. Focus on that. Stop worrying about other people. And now when we get to John, there are some interesting comments made. So verse 22 and 23, Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that his disciple was not to die. 
Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is a very interesting passage. When is this until I come? Until I come. What is that referring to? Does this say that John won't die at all? No, he's not to die yet. Jesus did not say that he wouldn't die. Just that it wouldn't happen before Jesus came. Put those two together and think about that. Here's a timeline here. John's death happens after Jesus comes, according to this text. And this coming is after the ascension of Jesus. Because it is clearly talking about coming again. But it is before John dies. Think through that for a minute. Those who are familiar with eschatology even more. Think through that for a minute. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that again. Because this is helpful with timelines. Putting these things into, into a timeline so we can think through it. John's death, according to this text, it's right clear. John's death happens after Jesus comes. What does that coming mean? When? And this coming is after the ascension of Jesus because it clearly is talking about coming again. But it's before John dies. So this can't be talking about the beginning of the eternal state. Heaven, after the final end, the final judgment. Because John will die after Jesus comes. And death, does that happen in the eternal state? No. So here's two crucial questions here that are really important. What is this coming of Jesus referring to? What is the event of it? And is it a physical coming of Jesus? A physical coming of Jesus. If any of you think about end times views, eschatology, this is pretty important because it helps us to kind of think through some popular views. Examine end times views and think through what typical end times views texts mean, according to some. Because a lot of times, in many camps, the, the, the description of Jesus coming, we automatically associate that with the second coming. Only. And that's it. But is that what this is saying? need to be careful. And this is a text that I think helps us to kind of think through things a little bit more. This is not a mystery, though it's hard to think through. It's not a mystery. It's God's revealed will that he shows us, that helps us to kind of analyze and think through some of these things. And again, test what we hear. His will, be, his will will be accomplished. And here it paints the picture that John will die after Jesus comes. This event that it's talking about has to happen before John dies. John gets exiled to Patmos. He doesn't die like Peter does, does he? So there's a timeline again. So what is this coming referring to? It's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's referring to where God judges his covenant people in a finality in many ways, in an earthly sense, in a historical sense, that he comes and judges his people. Why? In the big picture, because they rejected the Messiah. So it's a final pronouncement of judgment when he comes and Destruction in Jerusalem happens in 70 AD. That's the coming of Christ that it's talking about. But we easily say, no, that stuff is future. 
Well, Jesus will come back, but that's not what this is referring to. And that's not what a lot of other texts are referring to. A lot of them refer to this time period of Jesus coming to judge his people. The destruction of Jerusalem that was wiped out. Jonathan Edwards, I was thankful that Matt Ware posted this in a group chat this week. I just want to read a portion of it about the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, This destruction of Jerusalem was in all respects agreeable to what Jesus had foretold of it, the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, as appears by the account which Josephus gives of it, who was then present. Josephus was a Jew back in that time period, and who was one of the Jews having a share in this calamity and writing the history of their destruction. Many circumstances of this destruction resembled the destruction of the wicked at the day of judgment by his account, by what Josephus said. It was accompanied with many fearful sights in the heavens and with the separation of the righteous from the wicked and their city and temple were burnt and razed to the ground and the ground on which the city stood was plowed. And so one stone was not left upon another. We, I think, the contemporary Christian church does not have a lot of understanding of this time period, of what happened, and the parallels of what were going on, and Jesus coming, not physically, but coming and destroying Jerusalem because they rejected their Messiah. It was a judgment upon his people. And so this text is very helpful in just starting to really think through that and slowing down and to not buying into every language that says, oh, the coming of Jesus, and we immediately attribute it to the second coming, which will happen. But does every text that say that immediately and and automatically apply to that, talk about that? No. And a bigger picture then to bring that back into what we were talking about with Peter versus John God's will will be accomplished. He's sovereign over every event of life. And he's sovereign over the way of death. He's sovereign over Peter and John. He's sovereign what they do, and he's sovereign over how they die. He's got a purpose in all of it. He ordains life and death. We don't have control over our death. You do not have control over your death. When it's your time, it's your time. And so we need to honor God in all of our life. And we need to not be caught up in other people and what they're doing and comparing ourselves to them. But we need to plow ahead in the will of God for our life, knowing He's sovereign. Which brings in a bigger view that we need to see. Verse 25, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them be, to be written down, I suppose that the, whole, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. What does this teach us in broad terms? His work and his works and purpose in the world are for one beyond our grasp. If they can't can be t- contained in a book, then we really can't contain him in our minds if you really think about it. He's an infinite God, he's in infinite ways. He's beyond our thoughts, beyond our comprehension in it. Everything that he does, he's magnificent, glorious in everything that he does. I mean, can you think about all of what he does and all of the purpose, the reasons for what he does? So it's beyond our grasp. Like his works are beyond the scope of what is written by John. Endless works, timeless works that glorify him and that bring us to great humility and great purpose, striving ahead with a kind of paradox running in our life saying, I can't comprehend this God. I can't understand all that he does And his purpose is infinite. His works are mighty, timeless, endless. But yet he has called me for a purpose for me? 
And his purpose will be done in my life? He will draw me out further because he's worked in me deeper? What? I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that at all. Not only in my nature, but in my stumbling, in my faults, in my mistakes. Just like last week, Jesus wants to continually reinstate us. He wants to continually pull us up and say, keep going and grow here. Do this here. Follow me here. I'm leading you to do this. So step out more. Trust me. Stop doubting. Stop questioning. Stop comparing yourself. But move forward because my works are infinite. And you won't be able to grasp them. You won't be able to discern everything that I do. We can't see all that he does in every single situation. I have no idea what happened in Bethlehem. There were glimpses of some things that, happened, that, I, that we saw. Some annoyances. As we brought the word of God to those people, to those city officials, they were annoyed. They didn't want to hear it. And a woman there came up and tried to refute us, tried to speak against us. There were things happening that we saw, but that's only a a minute glimpse of what was going on. And here's the purpose. Again, the the sovereignty of God and his purpose. What happens when God's word goes out? Does it return to him empty, with no purpose, useless? No way. He will accomplish what he has purpose for it when he sends it out. And so we be faithful. Is there fail- failure in faithfulness? No. Nope. We need to remember that stuff so that we go out further, so that we step out in this situation more boldly, more clearly, all remembering that we can't see a lot of what he's doing, a lot of the purposes that he has. He's got a revealed will, and that's what we hold in our hands, his word that's living and active. That's what we are to know if we are to live wisely in this world and not foolishly. We are to know his will. We are to do his will, his revealed will. But there is a hidden will that he has that we won't know. Did Job know about the interaction with God and Satan? Nope. So God had a hidden will for Job. They had no idea about. So we need to remember and not strive to figure out God's hidden will and every answer, every why, every reason. We need to be faithful to the Word of God and what God has called us to do in obedience to Him and walk through that in the time that He has placed us in in history. Which all of that brings glory to our triune God. We need to think Trinitarianly. That God, the sovereign God, has his purpose. And he brings that to be accomplished through Christ. And that's applied by the Spirit that actually happens in life. And that, again, expands throughout all of human history. Can't fathom all of what God does. We can't fathom all of what Christ has done. But yet we have it written. We have His will written. that We can understand and see who God is, what He does, how He does it, and what He calls us to. So be mindful of all of this. Strive to focus on His will for you and don't get caught in worrying about other people. We need to know what other people are doing and be involved in each other's lives. But that's completely different than comparing, oh, well, but he's going further, but she's doing this, but this, but this, but this. No. What is that to you in the bigger picture? You follow Christ. You fulfill what he calls you to do, and you do it faithfully. You do it with great effort, purpose, striving, all the while knowing that God is sovereign over every detail of your life. Glorify him in that. Be in awe of his wondrous works and make those wondrous works known to the world around you. 
I said this last week. I've said this many times. And I'll say it till I die. You don't know what God will do with you, do you? So go find out. Right? So go find out. Live faithfully to your gracious God. Let's pray.